Good afternoon and welcome to this event in, uh, in the premises and in the room of the Bergen uh, School of Global Studies. My name is Lisa Wagner and I'm one of the co-directors of the Bergen School of Global Studies and Huobo Huosta, who you will get to know much more about later, is one of the pillar leaders. Many of you maybe wonder, what is the Bergen School of Global Studies? Well, first of all, it is an ambition and a very, very early start of something we hope will end up becoming a vibrant uh, graduate studies program. So master's and PhD study program in global development challenges and global challenges. To us, we think that the world faces five major global challenges. Today, climate is the one we're going to talk about. The other four that we focus on in, in the Bergen School of Global Studies is governance, uh, health, or the health pandemics, migration, and inequality. So the, the aim of, of the school is to that all the courses in English at the master's and PhD level are presented in our portal of the Bergen School. And that you can all sign in and you know and, and take these courses. We also want to develop new courses. In addition to being sort of a hub for all the, the, the courses, it's also kind of a hub for activities in the various pillars, like the one we're having today. And one of the main aims, which is why I think this is such a great, great seminar, is that we think we need to think in brand new ways, not only about how to be, you know, how to solve global challenges, but how to teach, how to be a student and how to be educated in terms of solving and understanding the global challenges. So for us, we could, I think I want to say we have a, quite a radical ambition that we really want need to think in new ways about how we teach and how we learn. And that is one of the main ambitions of the Bergen School of Global Studies. And so, therefore, I'm super excited and happy to introduce Huoba Huosta and this panel where we will start this discussion. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you very much, um, Lisa. Uh, my name is Huoba Huosta. I'm a professor of human geography and the director for the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation and responsible for the climate pillar of the Bergen School of Global Studies. Um, and we're very happy to, uh, this is uh, the first climate related event that we're putting together as part of the Bergen School of Global Studies, very happy uh, about that. Um, so welcome to the seminar and panel debate uh, on, um, which has been called um, the emerging climate emergency, what now for university education. In early August, uh, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, launched its sixth uh, assessment report. And this report has later in the Norwegian media, at least, been referred to as Code Red. I think its main messages um, are things that we have been uh, uh, familiar with for a while. Um, but what happened this time is that its messages um, were, were amplified by a series of wildfires, a series of, of floods, uh, extreme weather across, uh, across the planet. So this has really, I think, shook us as a society and has really impacted the political debate uh, in the election that we just had um, here in Norway. And I think now this, this um, understanding uh, that we're living in uh, a climate emergency is becoming more and more widespread. Whether policies are following suit is another question. But I think this, um, uh, at least this, this uh, message, message of urgency um, is, is out there. At the university, we, I would say uh, we've been aware of this for, for quite some time, uh, most of us. And um, we have, in the past few years, shifted our research uh, to focus more and more on, on climate change. Uh, here at the University of Bergen, we've had the Birkenes Center for Climate Research for a long time. Um, in 2017, we established the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation, which is looking at society's response uh, to this issue. 
Uh, and climate and energy transition is one of the three uh, strategic pri priority areas uh, of the university uh, as a whole. So at least at that level, uh, there's focus uh, on this, uh, on the research uh, side. In terms of education, I'm tempted to say that much um, is continuing like before, with some good uh, and important uh, exceptions that we will hear about today uh, in this panel, uh, including the Bergen School of Global Studies. Um, but I would say, by and large, the main uh, norms of education, the main structures of education, uh, the main ways that we're doing things uh, in education uh, are pretty much uh, the same, even though we are, are kind of accepting this, this major uh, challenge, uh, major uh, crisis we, we're living. So, and this is what we want to, to bring focus on um, today. Uh, are we giving our students the competences and capabilities that they need uh, to be leaders and mobilizers of uh, a green shift? I'm not sure we are, uh, actually. But um, um, that's what we'll debate today. How, to, um, how do we characterize the current situation and what do we do to move, to, move, to move forward? The big question, what does the climate crisis mean for how we develop educational programs and teach students in the university? How do we rethink education in light of the climate emergency? And what courses, pedagogical methods, skills, and approaches do we need? So um, to put together a panel on this, uh, we thought about uh, who could we uh, invite who may have interesting ideas. Uh, and we're very happy that um, these uh, fine people accepted and wanted to be part of the panel. Um, thank you so much. So we'll hear from um, Runa Falk, uh, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Foreign Languages and part of the LinkLin uh, research group uh, and part of also this new exciting course, Climate 200, Climate Narrati Narratives. Right. Then we have Jakob Gandin, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Geography and the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation. Uh, and he's the initiator, or initiator of the collaboratory, which we will uh, hear more about. Roger Stone, professor at the uh, Center for the Study of the Sciences and the Humanities, SVT, um, and part of this new master's program in sustainability that I believe you're going to tell us a little bit more about. And finally, but not least, uh, Lea Andrea Eglon a student in comparative politics um, and part of the student society, Student de Champfini. So we'll start, uh, we're going to have a, a nice and casual uh, conversation, I think, but we'll start with um, each of um, them giving a uh, roughly five minute um, introduction to some of the things that your uh, initiative or, or uh, background stands for in this, uh, in this regard and, and in your thoughts on the future of education in light of the climate emergency. So we'll start with you, uh, Ruda. Yeah, thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, as you said, I'm part of the LinkedIn research group at the Department of uh, Foreign Languages, where we uh, study the language use related to the issue of climate change in a cross-disciplinary perspective. So that is, we study uh, the different voices and views and interests in the climate debate. And we recently established a course, uh, Climate Stories, or Climat uh, which is based on our research in the research group. And it's a five credits uh, bachelor level course um, where we examine examples of different contributions to the climate debate. Uh, for example, Greta Thunberg's speech to the UN, uh, news articles, and uh, climate fiction, uh, such as Marlinde's uh, novel, Blå. And we then identify and discuss uh, different stories that are represented in these texts. And the aim of the course is to reflect upon the various ways in which the questions related to climate change are communicated and how these different stories can affect our understanding of the climate issue. And the course is multidisciplinary in the sense that we are five teachers coming from different disciplines. And these are linguistics, literature, science, media studies and political science. Uh, and we combine these different perspectives when we teach. And the course is also multidisciplinary in the sense that the students come from different uh, disciplines. The course is open to students from every faculty, 
and in the spring we had a plan for 15 students but uh, we had to, it was so popular so we had to close it at the limit on 50 but uh, and then we couldn't have the ancient amnot pack but uh, this uh, semester it's also open for ancient amnot pack and we really think it's a strength to the course that uh, uh, there are so many students with different backgrounds and our teaching is a mix between lecture and seminars where we try to facilitate for discussions with the students and there's also a mandatory uh, presentation that every student has to do with uh, on a topic that they can choose themselves but it has to be related to climate in uh, one way or the other um, and this presentation and also the other input that we get from the students really is a strength uh, uh, to the course. It's been really enriching to hear different uh, perspectives from the students. And then finally, climate change. What now for a university education? Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the climate issue is uh, no longer an issue primarily for the natural sciences, but that every discipline and every program should try to contrib contribute with the insights and uh, perspectives that they can offer. And secondly, I think um, um, since the climate change uh, is a complex problem, it's a good idea to expose um, students to perspectives from different disciplines. And the university uh, tends to be very specialized, uh, but I think it can be helpful and also improve the general understanding uh, when you see a problem from different angles. Thank you. Jakob. Thank you. It's, it's really great to, to be here. And, and um, uh, also, I think that thinking about, about climate change in this emergency framing is also quite a new thing. And I, that spurred me to reflect a bit on what are kind of the implications of this emergency framing. And I think that one thing is that we're really in for some seriously scary, scary stuff the next couple of decades, both in terms of climate impact and other impacts, but I think also in terms of the politics that might be mobilized and legitimated through this type of emergency framing. Uh, second, I think in terms of knowledge and learning, um, I think what we're doing here is that we're losing, in a sense, our chronological continuity with the past. So I think this has also serious consequences for how we organize in, uh, organized higher education where we often look backwards and look towards the past to learn about the future. And then I think the third thing is that actually we in higher education are really implicated in these problems, not only in terms of the fact that we are not at all equipped to respond to the climate emergency, but also in the fact that we are also part in actually sustaining unsustainable trends through our practices at the university. So as you said, Lisa Rackner, we really need to think about education in a brand new way. And for me, I think that concerns both kind of reconsidering the content of higher education, as you said, like what do we teach? What do we include? What perspectives do we include in our courses? Also the form of higher education, how do we learn? And maybe even how do we learn together? And then finally, I think we also need to think about how do we organize higher education? I think we need to think about brand new ways to organize higher education. Who gets a say in the design of educational programs with regards to sustainability and climate issues? And I think this is kind of what we're trying to experiment with in a very small way uh, at the collaboratory. Uh, at the collaboratory, we organize the um, basic conference, the Bergen International Students Conference every year, uh, an international conference that collects about 100 students from across uh, Europe and the Nordics especially. We also organize the set to one course in sustainable innovation, a 10 credit course. The students work with um, active um, sustainability problems from different uh, local actors in the Bergen municipality. And we're also very closely involved in the Arcus Alliance and work with challenge-based learning uh, through that alliance together with great friends at SPT. Mm. And I think what's special about us is that we really try to build our uh, activities as an active partnership between students and researchers. We really place students in the driver's seat in organizing and defining the content and process of higher education. So we actually employ them, we pay them to do this work, which is super important. And I think what we're trying to do then is to be some kind of laboratory where we can experiment with different forms of collaborating and learning together in relation to these challenges. And I don't know if any of you have been to some of our activities, but I think my, my sense is that we really have a different feeling to our activities compared to most of the other uh, courses at the university. And I think the reason for that 
is because this type of model of organization where students are actually the active force in shaping education, it also leads to a very different type of learning atmosphere and a different form of, of learning together, uh, very much based on participation of workshops and actually not that many lectures. When we ask students to create education, lectures get kind of put quite far down uh, on the priority list and, and, and we find new ways of, of organizing things. I think in terms of content, we have interdisciplinarity, uh, ethics, uh, practical perspectives, critical perspectives that really can come to the fore. And I think what I think we're really proud about is that we really try to institutionalize a constant reinvention of what we do in order to stay relevant. And I think in terms of emergencies and emerging problems, I think we really need to reinvent the wheel together every year. And I think this brings me to three themes that I think we are kind of struggling with and would like to explore right now was in our activities. And I think one of those is, are we learning from the past or, or from the future? And how can we then organize higher education where we could also be directed towards the future? Uh, the second question is, how might we actually open up the future for deliberation, perhaps through pluralism or practices? And I think the third one is really, what are the implications of this emergency framing of climate change and other social problems for higher education? How does that actually re reframe our role as higher education institutions, as students and as, uh, as uh, faculty at university? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's very tempting to start to discuss already, but I, I will <laughs> refrain from that because we'll get a chance what, later. what Runa and, and, and Jakob are talking about, of course, it's, uh, it's very easy to agree with what you've been saying. It's also uh, um, easy to commend what you're doing. And, and at the SVT, the Center for the Study of the Sciences and Humanities, we, I think we have learned from what you do. And then we also try to find our own niche and, and try to do something slightly different. So we are involved in, in uh, education or teaching around, I would say, yeah, climate, but perhaps with the larger, uh, the larger perspective of sustainability more in, in general, perhaps, um, through the Arcus collaboration that Jakob mentioned, through our role as the secretariat for an upcoming UNESCO report on, on uh, teaching in the 21st century uh, in the light of sustainability. That, I just wanted to anticipate. And then through this master program that uh, already um, was mentioned. So this master program that uh, we actually took in the first student, set of students now in, uh, in August, uh, we have 20 places for this master program. There were close to 300 applicants. So this is clearly, you know, for a program that has never been run before and, and without any advertisement, basically. So, so the students see the need for this would say that this program is moderately interdisciplinary. So it's, it's not an attempt of recreating the chaos pilot education that we've seen in other places. It's not a transdisciplinary program uh, necessarily, but it's moderately interdisciplinary in the sense that uh, the students are going to anchor, they would find an anchor in, for instance, uh, in the Department of Biology or the Department of, of Geophysics or or at some other department of the university, but they will have something on top. Um, the way we think is that there will be a need for a multitude of types of expertise, not only a multitude of disciplines, but a multitude where there is quite a very important role for monodisciplinary knowledge. And in a way, remarkable that we have nobody from our you know, world leading environment on climate science in, or you are not representing them. So no. it's, no. <laughs> so in a way we have to remember them and, and they play an extremely important role. And then our vision for this master program is that even if the student ends up writing a, a research study, let's say more closer to marine biology or whatever, they will know when to think about calling the lawyer or calling the political scientist or, you know, that the idea is that they recognize problems to be wicked and, and sort of see the need for other types of expertise. And that is more or less where we are. I mean, we don't really have any results yet because we've just gone on for three, four weeks. Okay. 
first off, thank you all so much for inviting me and raising this important discussion. I look very much forward to the conversations ahead of us and to represent the students' perspective in this seminar. Um, climate change and the climate discussion is something that we surround ourselves with every day. We think about the climates in, in the decisions we make and in many areas of life, uh, climate is an, is an important discussion. However, we need to acknowledge the way that we talk about the climate crisis in society today, the way we appreciate the conversation on climate in our everyday lives. Too often, in my opinion, and to too large of an extent, the climate, the climate crisis is reduced to a normative debate looking backwards. We place guilt, we talk about how we got here, we denote each other as climate pigs or climate friendly in our everyday actions, and we end the conversation where we have to start it, at the point of looking forward. I think the students and the young generation in general are tired of talking about the climate crisis, and we want to focus on the discussion, we want to focus the discussion on climate solutions. I think we want a discussion where we acknowledge that the climate crisis isn't just a normative debate, but a crisis that has to be solved. We don't need another discussion on how we got here, uh, what the climate crisis means for us, or whether or not humans are at fault for the situation that we find ourselves in. We know the extent. Most other people know that as well. And regardless of how we got here, the essence of the climate issue remains that humans are the ones who can solve it. We want to engage in that perspective and learn about the solutions, learn about the complexity, and engage in the way forward now. I think a key word is engagement. We want to focus on action. We need to see how some people have been looking forward for years already and uh, focus on how many people are prepared to join. I'm very glad to see this initiative, the BSGS initiative and uh, a more interdisciplinary uh, introduction towards uh, the way we should run our school system now. And I'm excited for the student involvement in this and that our solution, that solutions are at heart of the debates and engagements that we want to see. So on that note, I look very much forward to the conversation and hopefully they will be fueled by the, engage, the engagement that we need. Thank you all, that was uh, excellent. And thank you being, for being so uh, uh, clear and also forward and solutions uh, looking. That's, that's a very good start. And I, I really like to talk about, um, to be forward looking uh, in this debate and to talk about solutions. But I do think we should start to talk a little bit about, um, to be a little bit problem oriented uh, before we move on to, to that. So, um, so, so I wanted to ask you, um, so um, we've had this talk about interdisciplinarity and the need for uh, focus on, on solutions um, to work together across, to expose students to different perspectives for quite some time, but it seems to me that we're still um, kind of lagging behind in actually doing it. Um, what would you say um, are the main sort of constraints on, on really, uh, really um, working sort of in a more interdisciplinary, forward-looking way? And I saw your reaction already there. Uh, so I'll let you start. Yeah, where to begin? So first, we're at the University of Bergen. And uh, the last time I was here, or the time before, I think, we had a comment by a previous rector of this university who just noted that our institution is particularly poorly rigged for interdisciplinary collaboration. Okay? And that has to do with, down to very practical things of how incentives are being uh, divided and things like that. So we have an institutional setup that is just contrary to this. And some of us have been talking about this for 25 years at this uh, institution, but I, I'm still hopeful that at some point uh, this is going to shift. So that's a sort of very low level thing. Then I, I think if I can say one more thing there, uh, of course the problem is, the climate problem is larger than that it could be solved by the University of Bergen becoming progressive. So, um, you said, uh, Hobart, in your opening statement that, um, that the IPCC report shook us in Norway and the media said it was code red. And now we had elections uh, earlier this week and if I'm not mistaken, 97% of the electorate shows 
not to vote for the party that wanted a full committal to stop exploring for more oil. So we're clearly not that shaken. So, and then again, you know, in, people have the knowledge. I mean, they're not, they know about the problem. So what kind of lock-ins are we facing here? Of course, there are multiple lock-ins. Well, some of them are normative. It's sort of, what do I want for myself in my life? But I also think that we have to discuss, and especially in this panel, which has a sort of bias toward the social science and the humanities, perhaps, the kind of institutional lock-ins that we are facing here. And this is something that we try to put at the fore of our master program now, that the students are not told that this is just to be, you know, innovative and have ingenuity and then everything will be okay, because it won't. But that the problems are in nature, whether you would want to call them wicked or complex or super wicked or whatever, but it takes other forms of expertise and other forms of action to try to overcome these lock-ins. So we have to understand what the lock-ins are and what the lock-in is. And doing that, we also have to look at the history of how these institutions became the way they are. So in a way, we, we, we want to ignite the sociological imagination in the students, even if they're going to marine biology or geophysics, because otherwise they will just be repeating the same old messages that we heard for 30 years. Nothing is going to happen. Just to, to have that noted, I, I agree with you. Uh, we did, uh, on this um, social science humanities uh, bias, we did invite Kiki Klavin and a couple of others from the Acting Center who were not able to, to, to participate. And at one point we said, let's just, uh, let's just go for it. These panelists have such a broad scope and open mind that we can, we can, um, we can do well uh, without them. But um, just to have that noted. I want to uh, continue with you, uh, Eru, now on the same, same question. And when you um, put together this course, uh, and your experiences with that. Um, and you said it's important for students to get this exposure from other perspectives. But what, what uh, we're still on the problem uh, focus here. So what kind of constraints have you experienced? So what sort of things have you um, uh, come across uh, in terms of difficulties in trying to get, to get this uh, cross-disciplinary um, education together? It's a price. Um difficult to get uh, teachers from uh, other faculties or that are outside our uh, research group because of the incentives that you mentioned yes yeah, so that's very technical and then you need uh, people to do your favors um which is of course the solution but it's uh it's more um vulnerable than uh, uh, in traditional teaching i suppose uh, and another problem and um, challenge is uh, to communicate this uh, um, offer that we have, like we have a new course, we want the students to know about it, but it's difficult to reach out to all the students and, and so that they know that this is something they can apply for. Uh, so there's probably something that could have been done there to mm. make it easier to communicate uh, across the university. Yeah, but I think uh, if I move away from the problem, it was uh, an advantage that our research group was already like the interdisciplinary. So we had a lot of disciplines to uh, take from. Mm. So Jakob, the sustainable innovation course has drawn students from across all faculties, I, I think. Um, We've had applicants from all faculties, but yeah. everyone has been able to participate. No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's still quite broad. Right? Yeah. What's, the, what's been the success factor there? Yeah, but, but I think, before that, maybe could we just take a minute to talk about the problems? <laughs> uh, because, uh, I think just to build on, on this fact, because I think it's one thing is the kind of institutional barriers to interdisciplinarity, and, and I think we all know about them painfully at the University of Bergen, and we know that we have to build our education on favors from Roger Strand and others that just contribute in a very nice way. Uh, but I think the other level of that is that actually interdisciplinary learning is super difficult, right? And most of the research at the university that are kind of highly skilled, highly trained, they're not able to do interdisciplinary research. They're not able to collaborate interdisciplinary. And then we expect, expect our students at bachelor's and master's level to conduct this very kind of complex process of, of interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think we also here need to underscore, I think, the value, as you said, of monodisciplinary perspectives, of the depth and kind of the tools that you get from a discipline. And I think we should also be 
beware of some of the really failed interdisciplinary uh, ventures and initiatives that we see around the world that are, I would say, are very much based on certain key imported frameworks, often from the natural sciences that are then applied to social phenomena, uh, which means that we have a very kind of watered out understanding of society. So I think there are lots of difficulties here in interdisciplinary. I think in terms of our course, I think our course is multidisciplinary. We have perspectives from many different uh, disciplines, and I think our students get to kind of discuss with, with, with people from different disciplines, from most of the faculties at the university, and I think that's great. But that doesn't mean that we get interdisciplinary learning within each and every student. And I think facilitating that interdisciplinary learning process, I think, is, is tricky. I think we are, we're, we're trying to do it. I don't think we succeed all the time, but I think what's interesting is to also get our own students to reflect on their own contributions. And I see often those reflections don't bring up kind of specific themes or specific theories. It's more like I'm kind of from the media sciences. Uh, so I know kind of this kind of method or, or I'm, I'm uh, so they, they know methods, they know kind of approaches. So there's more of those things that are shared rather than kind of specific content. and. Uh, mm and uh, perspectives, perhaps. So Lea, uh, you're a student in the panel. Now you get to represent all the students at the University of Bergen. Uh, oh. <laughs> but, uh, no, so so um, for students coming into education, um, and well, you can use yourself as, uh, as an example here. I guess you can't represent everybody. But, but um, what, what, uh, what, what's your reaction to this, the, to this, this discussion of interdisciplinarity uh, versus uh, sort of what Olga called sort of mono perspective um, education. I imagine that many students are coming in and wanting to learn a certain skill set, a certain trade. Um, they are uh, sort of uh, imagining themselves in, in a particular job or career in the future, uh, which kind of depends on, on having, um, you know, being trained in that particular uh, direction. And then we're sitting here talking about you need exposure from all kinds of different <laughs> perspectives uh, to solve the climate crisis, which will then be your job. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on this? I think that I very much agree with the premise that we want uh, specialized knowledge that we can uh, apply for a certain job so that mm -hmm. we know that when we apply for, in my case, probably a were some job in the municipality or something in state government or something. Uh, that I have the knowledge to do that. Um, but I al I'm also quite aware of the fact that uh, one side of the story is not enough, one side of knowledge is not enough. And um, that we want, first and foremost, knowledge that we know that will uh, result in something that means something in, in work life. And we know more now than ever that we need interdisciplinarity also in work life. So I think we were very much welcome those kind of initiatives and uh, to a too large of an extent it is too difficult for us to know how to get that relevant competence uh, seeing as we have to apply for our own subjects we have to we don't really get those guidelines to think interdisciplinarily uh, probably something related to the institutions that that um, wishes that to happen for that certain way but I think that we welcome interdisciplinarity and that we welcome uh, initiatives that rely, that make us think outside the box. Uh, we are, live in a society where everyone gets higher education. You need to uh, be relevant. And that probably means having a certain competence that someone else doesn't. So yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, okay. How do you find this balance in the master's program and sustainability? Is that a total interdisciplinary type of program or are you also giving them specific skills i mean when someone finishes the program and go to an employer and say i'm a master of sustainability uh, what do they actually know what can they what kind of skills do they have mm. so first of all i want to say that we uh, uh, we haven't done this yet because it's first next year but our uh, students get to choose between doing a research-based master thesis or an internship based master thesis. And this is a huge experiment for us. That, you know, they can have an internship for half a year and then write a, 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 a master thesis about that, about how to work concretely with a challenge 
related to, to climate or, or other aspects of sustainability within a company, for instance. So, so those who take that path, they hopefully will get something very concrete and sort of actionable out of it. And, and we, we have excellent students. So, I mean, we, we trust the students. We, we haven't really made the deals with the companies and organizations yet, right? We're gonna do that next week or something like that. So that is sort of one part of it. And then uh, answering the other part of your question. So what we do is that the first, first couple of semesters, the first year, we kind of bombard them with the multitude of perspectives. It means that they will know about the problems, the wicked problems from a number of fields, law, sociology, history, et cetera, et cetera, biology, climate science. And then, of course, they have to choose something because you can't do a master thesis on all of this. So this is where it comes, this kind of, okay, so I'm going to do a master that will specialize in something in, in marine sustainability, for instance, but, but with a reflection chapter or something like that, but what, where would the law come in? Where would the regulations come in here? Where would, you know, when is consequential or whatever sort of in the municipal sector, what is, how would that come into play? And I think that this is, this is also based because, I mean, we have contact with people who have the kind of job that you talked about, you know, in Fylkesman, the county governor or the municipalities or the directorates or companies. And of course their situation, our, the people we study together with, they're in the same situation as you and me. That is, we are having a job where most of our tasks uh, are autodidact. So most of the, I mean, this is the secret of work life for academics. Most of the things that you do in the job afterwards, even if it's inside the university, you were never trained for. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell the students that <laughs> yeah I mean, of course we tell them that that's the whole point we have to tell them that because they have to start to think about it now rather than having this overwhelming surprise that shit you know i'm trained as a biologist nobody told me that i have to understand the details of how to do consequential training impact assessments deal with the lawyers, deal with this, deal with that, deal with the, the, the city council, deal with the politicians there. I mean, and, and this hopefully can lead to something more actionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, a, uh, I'm based at the Department of Geography. Um, and that is a department which also has quite, an, I would say, an interdisciplinary perspective on its own discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many of the, our candidates end up in those types of jobs um, in, in the uh, Fylkesman, at municipalities. Um, and I think one of the, the main feedbacks we get on the candidates that we educate is that they are really good at collaborating, understanding problems and seeing a coherence uh, in, in things. I think the downside could be that sometimes it's hard for a few prospective employers to see exactly what, what their specific skill set is. Um, but they, 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 they really know these skills of, of collaboration and, 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 and uh, yeah, learning things themselves, which I think is uh, it's quite important. Uh, all right. Um, so one thing that was striking, I think, in all of your uh, opening statements was this perspective on the future. Uh, and you, in particular, Jakob, uh, brought this up. Um, and um, we've discussed this bef before, of course, but, but uh, a key question uh, for me through all of this has been, okay, how do we learn about the future? <laughs> and how do we, I, I totally agree when you say, yes, um, I mean, our, our standard way of, of, of doing this uh, or educating ourselves has been to sort of look at what's happened in the past, but we to a further extent need to understand sort of uh, how, what implications this has for the future, if I understood you correctly. Um, but of course, the future is unknown. Uh, so how do we how do we do this? I mean, what sort of methods and techniques do we have for for shifting our perspective in education towards the future? I think I think this is uh, this is also an organizational issue, and it's like a didactic issue. And as long as we build our educational lectures and exams, which is also kind of based on some kind of unholy alliance between students and teachers, which both kind of are feel that this is kind of a comfortable place to be. 
As soon as, as long as we do that, we'll never be able to learn from the future. We'll always learn from the past, which will definitely, in terms of this emergency framing, always be irrelevant uh, in a sense. So I think, how do we learn from the future then? I think uh, learning from the future that doesn't really exist, but emerges. I think this is a process that implies both kind of unlearning, suspending values, suspending theoretical perspectives, suspending visions about the world, unlearning those things, and also then kind of relearning and kind of pulling different bits together uh, into some kind of new uh, type of knowledge. That is, I think, then needs to be, I guess, in dialogue with practice, as you said, Leah. I, I think bringing people together in some kind of work with real world cases that are also emerging as they go on might be one way to learn about this. And then in that sense, you would also learn about collaboration, you would learn about interdisciplinarity and you would learn about those things as well. But I think this aspect of unlearning and suspending many things, I think is one of the key things I think for also moving towards the future. But I think then we need open forms of learning. We need workshops, we need uh, practice, we need um, uh, well, even panel discussions. We need to explore things together. Mm. I'd like to add on that actually, because I very much agree with that. You need to uh, debulk this way of learning where it's all happening in a lecture and in a seminar and it ends up in an exam. Because that way is very passive and it is very counterintuitive with what you are trying to do. You're trying to learn and give people skills for the future. You're trying to create this understanding um, that you can take. Um, Take into a <laughs> take into something that matters and take into society, which is not it's not set up like an exam. It's not set up like a lecture. You have to think in new ways, and doing that inside of a system, doing that as a student, where the most important thing is to get that grade on the exam, and it has to be good. That won't allow for that certain that new mindset to play, which is necessary. So. I think that is very much important and probably maybe a more easy institutionalized thing you can do than to change the entire educational system. But um, uh, yeah, focus on the exam and debulk it because it doesn't work. Yeah, I completely agree with what you say now. I see that we don't have our study director at the university in the audience right now. He's probably watching on the screen <laughs> uh, because this is an important debate. Um, I hadn't done master teaching in, in, in a while when we started to put together this new program now. And I was kind of sadly remind, sort of reminding myself that we have to give grades. We, we are not allowed to have just pass and fail. Um, this shifts the focus away from, from, the, from the real thing. So uh, we, we have to have that discussion again, I think. Uh, and we have to have it together with the students because also quite a few students who express discomfort with not having the grades in my experience. So, you know, I, I think not necessarily all the students agree there either, but I think it's an important discussion. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, I try, I'm trying to make sense of what you're saying, Jakob, about the future. <laughs> so, um, it, I have to think about that, but in the meantime, I can say how we relate to the future. And it's probably more like what you do and what you are expert on in your field, you know? because we think that the future is, not, is something that we create. And we create it through concrete action, but we also can, we create the future through imagination and the shaping of narratives and imaginaries. And that is actually something that we try to focus on in our courses, that it's, okay, there is prediction and predictive models is one way of relating to the future. But they don't really tell you how to change. They just tell you that you have a problem. But in order to create a new future, you need some kind of Im imagination. Right? And this is where the narratives come in. And this is where actually the history comes in as well. And to see that, for instance, when you engage in a certain job, and it, that could be a job in the municipality or at a company, that part of the skill set that 
is perhaps expected from you is to conform to their standard set of imaginaries and narratives about how things are and what gives value and what is important, which more than often are belong to a totally unsustainable way of life, of consuming more or making more value or you know whatever it could be. I mean, we just we could discuss the COVID nineteen for months in that perspective, right? It's probably the least sustainable that, we, but I guess we can learn from it, perhaps. But I, I would really like to hear your perspective on this: the narratives and the future, and narratives as a way of creating the future. Yeah, it's like you put it. Uh, that's also the um, idea behind um, uh, some of the things that we teach. That, uh, for example, in uh, the climate fiction, it's important to uh, study how. A novel describes the future of climate change because it can open up for different imaginations of uh, what the future will look like. And maybe that's something that uh, would be helpful if we had a, a positive vision of what the future uh, with low emissions could be. Hmm. I think this is, this is particularly important in the climate field because it's so driven by these, uh, these scenarios uh, and uh, you know the 1.5 degree, two degrees, and you have this RCPs. And if you look at the IPCC report, it's sort of uh, it, it's filled with these different uh, pathways and, and and scenarios where they uh, that are based on, on modeling and and a kind of a. Of course, they're very very useful to understand the problem, but at the same time, um, they are giving us a picture of um, the the future that is uh, determined in a way and they're determined into this direction or this direction and it's 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 unclear from that how um, we as change agents come into the picture uh, and and I I think um, for climate uh, both for climate research but also for education in climate change like to 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 put that point forward and show that what well, you just said, Irina, that the future is much more open, uh, that these models, which are in one sense, if they're used correctly, very, very helpful, um, cannot be you know, used on all forms of, of, of thinking. They don't show us the, 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 uh, the possibility of the openness of the future, which is actually, uh, actually there. So that's, that's another thing that I, that I, I totally agree with. It's important to bring into uh, into education, you know, to learn about um, both to understand, I think, um, uh, that, that knowledge that we have from from these models, but also understand very clearly their limitations. So, um, yeah, that's just a comment. But, uh, anyone would like to add to that? I see you raising your hand, Jakob. No, no, I think uh, just this idea that you put forward you know, on kind of opening up the future with deliberation, I, I just love that. And I also think it's this is also then something that should connect to our educational practices, right? I think for me, that would imply some kind of practice and process of pluralism where we would both expose ourselves and students to different theories, different methodologies, uh, different epistemologies, uh, uh, different political perspectives and different framings on, on, for example, climate change. But I think the second step of that would be to also engage in continuous reframing climate change from the different points of views and to be able to kind of navigate this field. So maybe sometimes when you're at uh, the Tulkis Manon, you will actually use that kind of language and you will use that framing, but then you're actually able to also uh, navigate across other framings and other circumstances in order to keep the future open in a way. And with that, then I wonder, uh, I think what's key here is also then not to, again, go into these practices that Tend to close down the field. I think we like to agree. So we end up either with some kind of anything goes relativism or we try to kind of converge to kind of one answer again. So I think then we also need to add dissonance and conflict into our kind of learning practices in a, in a nice civil way, perhaps, but still we need to be, we need to accept that there will be kind of conflict in the classroom as well and dissonance in the classroom. Yeah. I can add on that actually. Um, and I think that we want to, we want to have that distance. We want to have the disagreement and we want to learn from each other as well. 
we don't necessarily always have to listen to the professor or we have to listen to the professor but uh, <laughs> well, well uh, <laughs> and take into account that people have different perspectives and that that probably more to a bigger degree represents the larger picture than necessarily what a lecturer can do uh, in 45 minutes times 45 minutes so um, yeah, I think it is important to invite those discussions. And uh, even though nobody answers in the black Zoom screen, uh, that we have to put forward a way of thinking that activates the student and uh, instead of pacifying them. That is also something we do in uh, climate stories, uh, show that uh, not just um, disagreement based on values, but I mean, there's also disagreement, uh, uh, scholarly disagreement. And we try to show that that you can argue, scholars argue for this, but then you also have scholars that argue from the other perspective. And it's, um, uh, we used the book uh, that Mike Hume published um, um, a year ago on a student primer, where there are different chapters uh, where scholars uh, argue uh, in favor or against uh, different solutions to the climate issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, I started my university studies in 1987, so this is becoming old, probably. <laughs> um, and I've been at the in the university sector ever since. And I think that one of the, the I mean, I I haven't done empirical research on this, so it, I might be totally wrong, but my feeling is that. Um, there was more, the tempo wasn't so high always. So the tempo is faster now. And this, I think, is it's in the research that you have to sort of write something all the time and publish it and get the points and, you know. But it's also for the students. I mean, the, 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 most of the study programs are slightly shorter than they used to be. When that happened, it was, it was an explicit assumption that you know the, the level of the candidates should be the same. So but just everything should happen faster. And the courses got smaller and everything is sort of, we have been subjected to the same strategies of optimization and to become more effective, which is clearly one of these drivers to unsustainability. And this takes away some of the time that I think that we, that I nostalgic, nostalgically remember that we in a way could disagree or do something, you know, waste some time. Huh? Uh, and you say, uh, discuss in a civilized way, but also developing ways of conviviality as part of that building process that we went through. And, and that I think has, uh, some of this has been lost in a way because you are so busy all the time. You have to take all these courses and you have to rush through. And, and many of the things we are discussing now, they will, they will uh, take time away from those who want to push ever more into the curricula. So the more I can push of information into the students' heads or whatever is the idea, the better it is because then they will have a larger skill set. If we, if we could try to challenge this, and something is at stake there. Some of the dinosaurs in the departments now, to offend somebody that, that they would now start to think, but what are they going to take away? And not, not my pet part of the curriculum, please, because that is super important. Mm -hmm. But something has to take, be taken away in order to give space to something new. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think we, that discussion we have to take at every department. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1986, I started first grade or second grade maybe, but uh, I, so I haven't been around for that long, but I still see the same development. When I started my master's, I think, very few had the uh, goal of finishing within two years. It's more like, well, we'll see how long it takes. Uh, and uh, and now it's we're and I'm part of it. We are pushing them through, um, and we have these uh, milestone seminars and 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 reporting to do to make sure that they are on track. And there are very good reasons for that. But I totally agree that there are things that are lost, uh, and I think particularly this, um, uh, the room for disagreement uh, and to, to think more deeply about the curricula. 
uh, is, is something that's, um, that, uh, that, that's pushing this. Uh, but also on the research side, I think we um, are, are measured more and more as researchers. You know, how many citations do you have? How many proposals do you have? How many papers do you put up per year? And there's an ever increasing sort of speeding up of things, which we're seeing in society as well, which is part of why we are, are in a climate crisis, I think. Um, but uh, you, know, you and I are, are, have permanent positions and uh, they can't fire us even if we <laughs> stop publishing or stop right. doing research. So why don't we slow things down? I mean, why do you think that we keep uh, pushing this hamster wheel uh, every day? So let me take the question personally. Uh, it was I intended. That, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think that's the best way of taking it actually. So sometimes there will be uh, answers like, yeah, but what about my postdoc or what about my PhD who needs a new project? And, you know, so we're actually also keeping up the hamster wheel that way. I, I'm a bit on Twitter and follow, try to follow some of the things going on there. Um, I think when it comes to things, so this is new public management, Kelly, isn't it? Uh, Lisa, you help me out there. It is. And when it comes, to, yeah, when, when things are being pushed from the government, whatever kind of propaganda or political correctness being pushed from the government. It's my feeling, and I, I see this on Twitter, the intellectuals are the worst. It's good that we're not in the 1930s. I mean, the, the intellectuals are always the first rank to, to even anticipate the new type of propaganda from the, from the government and endorse it before it is even there. I've seen this, especially with COVID-19, if I may say that. No, and so we are in a way the worst. So one way of correcting this is to try to populate the classrooms with more people outside, from the outside. It give the students a larger role. They are not swallowed by the system yet, but also other people. So bringing them in other actors to have more polyphony in, in, the, in the classroom, I think. Mm. But, but, I, but I also think you, I think with the master that we are building up now, you know, Chete Lerumetweit, who is uh, the main architect behind this. So we talk a lot about, but what if the weather is nice? Should we just go for a walk with the students? We just, you know, we skip the, the topic for today and we go for a walk around Store Lungegårdsbanen, the lake that is contaminated. Perhaps that would be a good thing. Uh, I think we're going to do things like this. But we have to discuss it with the students, of course. Perhaps they also feel that they are losing something. <laughs> yeah, what will be the reaction from the students? The, the, the most uh, common question that we get from students when we do lectures, the first one is, will you post this PowerPoint uh, on uh, MIT uh, URB? <laughs> the other one is, will this be on the exam? Yes. So if Roger took you on, around the Sture Lundgård one, would you ask, will this be on the exam? That would be a very good exam. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think we would uh, we would appreciate the efforts and uh, accommodate that we were trying to uh, do something else and watching that the passive uh, passive uh, lecture, mm. but um, probably maybe a little weird. Mm. But weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take that into account. <laughs> I'll live with that. <laughs> <laughs> So Jakob and Runa, um, one question I had on my in in, in my notes is so how do we. Now, let me let me uh, contextualize it a little bit. I uh, I do both research and a little bit of teaching, and and when I look back at my time in the university so far, I have to say I think the the most sort of the area where I've had where we as university professors have the most impact is with the students. Actually, I think we assume that it's our papers, our research, uh, the clinic we write in the newspaper. But I think actually it's it's the time with the students and and the teaching that has. Uh, has uh, significantly the greater uh, uh, impact on, on on society. So, um, should we aim looking at the climate crisis? Should we aim to get students to be sort of active agents of change when they leave university? Uh, is that a goal of our education? And and how do we do that? Easy question. <laughs> uh, Iruna, if you want to go first. Oh, Jakob, whoever <laughs> wants to tackle it. I once got a question: Are you are you kind of uh, not at this university, by the way. Uh, are you kind of training the students to become activists? And, and there was actually a media thing about that. But uh, so I think we should, in a sense. But but I think what do we mean by that? I think this connects also both to the conversation we had and to kind of, I think the very dangerous emergency framing of politics and what type of society that could 
lead to in terms of geoengineering or the really harsh social controls we've seen with COVID and so forth. I think what we're doing here, we're also losing the potential for just transformation and for a climate transformation and sustainability to actually a proactive, happy project for society. Now it's mm -hmm. about kind of avoiding emergencies and kind of controlling people. So, so in, a, in a sense, I think that what do we mean with the people that should go out in society? And are these people that we're filled with knowledge and, and kind of skills or are the rather people that have been part of a certain environment and a certain kind of conversation as you both mentioned here. Like Doug Hammarskjöld once said that the purpose of liberal education is kind of a constant re-examination of the basic principles of society. And at the university, you go through that generation to generation. And I think I really like that picture of the universe as a space for reflection. I don't know if, it, if it's ever existed, but, but I really think that this is something we need to do. And, and I think we need them to find ways where people are able to kind of develop their integrity. Uh, I think also maybe their skills for resistance, to resist policies proposed by the government, resist other things. And I think these skills will be quite important in a couple of years' time when we're kind of really running into the, when, when the shit hits the pan, as the purpose say. Uh, and, and I think also civil disobedience. I think we are very obedient at the universities. We respond to funding calls, we respond to the idea that all our research should also have kind of a, a, a connection to partners, uh, and those partners are usually businesses and so forth. Uh, I think we should try to be a bit more disobedient, uh, both in the way we organize our universities, but also the way we look at kind of what type of students we want to, to get in the future. We don't want the students that nod and, and kind of say nice, well-studied questions. We want the disobedient students as well. Well, you know, are you educating active uh, uh, agents of change uh, in your course? Um, I think the short answer is no, uh, but uh, trying to educate the critical thinkers. Um, and I think as, Something that's important that we can teach uh, students is that um, there are also limits to science. So yes, we know this much about climate change, but it's not a final truth. It's just the best of our knowledge um, as of now. And of course, there are many people have different values and think different things they prioritize. So I think we should provide students with the skills to know the consequences of different choices, but then it's up to students to see what they think is important. And if they think the most important is to fight climate change, then they should become agents of the change. Hmm. So I agree with everything you're saying, um, Jakob and Rune, on this. Um, but there's one sort of underlying frustration for me here, which is, um, so these sort of, for example, Jakob said, uh, re-examine the basic uh, norms of society. I'm not sure if the norm was the term you used, but which I totally agree. I mean, that's if the university should be for anything, that, that's it, right? Uh, but at the same time, I mean, the, the, the way we uh, frame this seminar is climate emergency, and you were a bit critical to that term, but still, it's, it's, I, I'm sure you agree we need rapid change, right? And these processes of, of re-examining the basic norms of society, uh, critique, uh, learning, uh, disagreement, are very, very slow processes. But I think for those of us who feel that we are in a privileged, privileged position um, to structure education and, and, you know, and, and, and teach students about the world, we, we feel that we want to impact the kind of change that happens fast. You know, now we need to act right now. Uh, and then the tools that we have at our disposal, uh, the best ones, I think, you, which you described, are, are very slow. So how do, we, yeah, how do we think about this? How do you think about this? Um, yeah, I, I, that's, that's really a dilemma. And I think one thing is that we can actually open up courses where students can actually then work in real life projects with real people, real societal actors, and make some kind of contribution and maybe actually try to reframe things. So I think we can also open up the universe and I think we gain a lot from that. And one of the things is that we are able to create a space where you can engage with society before the five years of when you're kind of done with your master's degree. Uh, but I think the other thing is that maybe there's not always a dichotomy here because I, I think we have this idea that we need lots of time for, for this basic re-examination -exam and so forth and I agree. At the same time, we look at recruitment processes at the university. We, we sometimes have recruitment processes that take a year. 
And then we have, have other recruitment processes, for example, at the collaboratory, they take a week. And I wouldn't say that our recruitment processes are less deliberate. They are, I think we just organize them in a different way. We still create spaces for reflection. Uh, and, and I think we could probably think about that in terms of kind of the climate emergency. Well, I think we ne really need to protect these spaces of reflection and deliberation and disagreement. But they are pockets. And in other pockets, we can move fast. Uh, yeah, um, I agree with what you're saying. Probably some boundary conditions that also make it possible for you to recruit in a week. If you had been at a different faculty, I'm not going to mention any names here. It I, would have been. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is a kind of premise here in the way that the, the, the seminar is set up and the way that you, hope about, you know, frame it, which is like there is an urgency and we are the ones who are going to solve this and it's our responsibility to solve it. So, um, so how to say this without being immediately shamed uh, everywhere in, in social media now. So um, the problem is that even if there is an urgency, it may be that the sense of urgency doesn't help. So urgency and sense of urgency are, are two different things. And if, if you've been there and there's a need for first aid, you know that distinction. Right? You need to keep calm in a way. And it's also about whose role is it? So when there's an emergency, who do you call? You call the university professor, you probably don't. <laughs> so I, I, I saw information, the Danish newspaper had on had this thing on the you know, on the first front page, I think, who said, but if Norway can't do the energy transition, you have 14 trillions or whatnot in the pension fund, then nobody can. I think this is a, a completely wrong diagnosis. It's, I don't think it was meant as a diagnosis. I think it was meant as a, 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 a shaming of, of Norway, which I think was totally called for. But I would think that we will be the last because in contrast to the rest of Europe, we actually earn money on having the petroleum sector. We are gonna be the last ones. I mean, we are all, always the one with the best rhetorics, but it's a solution of the climate crisis coming from Norway. So, so, so I think what is called for here is also a reflection about what kind of role do we have. The university is a conservative institution. It is designed to be a conservative institution. It doesn't mean that we have to take five years to recruit somebody. I mean, that's just laziness. It's not being conservative. But it is set up to be the space where some kind of slow reflection can take place so that others can act faster. By that, I don't mean that we shouldn't do things like you do and you know, I mean, that's all called for because we need the polyphony. We need the different tempers also there. So, so you know, from how you describe your teaching, I think you do it with a different temper and, and that, or temperament. And I think that that is good. We should have a, a range of this as well. And then, you know, the, you know, the, the energy transition is, uh, is, is not going to be performed by Norwegian universities. And I think also the way that we uh, accommodate this climate situation is, even though it is something that, that is urgent, even though it's something that we have to take action to right now, it is also something that we have to think about in a long perspective. We have to accommodate that long perspective as well as the urgent <laughs> one. And, understand that the processes that we want to engage in that are to help the urgent factors could damage the long-term factors. And that, that balance, um, we have to take into account that balance and also understand that our urgent uh, ways of handling this uh, could hurt people. It could be, uh, it could directly implement to people's lives and it will, of course it will, and it has to because the extent of it is so huge. But we also have to understand the complexity of the solutions happening right now that they play into a larger mm -hmm. game and um, yeah, accommodate that into the education as well. We don't need people who uh, go around and tell everyone um, that uh, what they're doing is not sufficient. We yeah. need people who know mm -hmm. that 
what we're doing is acting in a bigger scheme and um, reflect upon that also in education. Mm -hmm. Did I see your hand? No. Okay, uh, yeah, I accept that. But then um, what is our responsibility? I mean, can we, can we specify that in a way? I mean, it's still, I, mean, I, I, I agree with you, but at the same time, you know, we're watching the launch of IPCC reports and we're seeing extreme weather on the news. And I do, while well, I agree, also feel, still have that, that sense of, of urgency and impatience and this idea that, well, I mean, as a university professor or anyone who's involved in teaching at the university has a specific responsibility for this. So what is that responsibility then? Is there a way of, of describing this in a positive way that gives us responsibility rather than defines what we are not responsible for? Yeah. I mean, anyone? I try to... I teach, uh, if I talk for myself, not speak for myself, I teach at different faculties. I've taught at all faculties, so mm -hmm. the University of Bergen, exceptional law. Um, I think even if the subject is human nutrition or, or, or cancer research, it, it, there is a responsibility to at least remind about the larger frame of things. So. E even if one is specializing on something, zooming in on something, I, I think that at the university and not at the univers university college, and this is not allowed to say, <laughs> but if we're at a general university, it's really like that, no? If you're at the general university, there should be a, a teaching responsibility to now and then zoom out say that, okay, so we are focusing on this type of very expensive cancer medicine now, or this particular need for human nutrition in Norway. But let us now zoom out and look at what kind of larger structure this is part. That I think, and, and that is at least one responsibility. The other responsibility I think is to, uh, and, and you, in a way it's inherent in your, your uh, idea of disobedience, it's just to be, uh truthful so and and so much of the public discourse and the discourse that we surround ourselves with with research funding and circular economy and whatnot it's simply not truthful and that we point out the cognitive dissonance and say but you know this is not going to work because we have knowledge that tells you that this won't work or you know, and and that is also i think a sort of general responsibility Jakob what do you think? What, what is our responsibility as educators? Yeah, I will second uh, your point that mm. um, everyone in every discipline should see what could be my contribution here. And of course, some disciplines would be more, uh, there are some disciplines where it would be more natural to think of climate change and some where it would be more uh, a distant topic. But I think uh, uh, really we should tackle the issue from as many angles as possible and that this is something we can do at the university that could be a, a good contribution. I think for me, I think we need to unpack this idea of the climate emergency because I, because I think what we're talking about here is still kind of two tracks. One is kind of this idea of a just transformation uh, that would be emancipatory and everyone would be happy and, and everything would be good. And I, to, to make that possible, we need to move really quickly because the window of opportunity is closing extremely fast, as we've heard the last 50 years. <laughs> uh, the, but so, of course, that to kind of enable that type of just transformation takes a certain skill set. And I think these are things we can experiment with at the university. I think through pluralism, by opening up the future, as you said, by, by kind of having practical courses uh, and, and so forth. So I think there's definitely room for those things that are kind of engaging and trying to open up and engage with the world in, in different ways. But then we have this emergency politics framing of the climate emergency and of the COVID emergency, which I really think has shown us that emergency politics is really, really bad territory to be. And I think that would then reframe our role as university quite a lot. And, and I think we need to work on that level as well. And that would mean to more think about uh, kind of what type of 
qualities of citizenship would we like to, would we need to see in such a world? What type of integrity? What type of yeah again disobedience? What type of skills for resistance would we also need to kind of develop and reflect on? So I think we need to work on both those tracks in parallel, and then the role of the pro professor in that. I, well, for me, it's kind of to create the space for students <laughs> to figure this out. Or the educator, also. yeah, or the educator. I think still it's the for us to create a space mm. where students are allowed to a large part figure this out on their own together with kind of pulling resources from the different disciplines at the university yeah. great leah now this feels like uh, closing statements uh, <laughs> so i think we're uh, um gradually wrapping up a little bit but um do you have anything you want to add to this I can start my closing statement by uh, <laughs> starting my opening statement as well i think that the as you all have said that um um yeah, we have to start doing something. And that brings me back to what I said in my opening statement, that we're tired of talk. We're tired of um, hollow promises and hollow uh, uh, implications of what the climate crisis actually is. We we'll read in the media that um, and this and this and this happens to the climate. And we, don't, we are not able to put it into a larger perspective on our own. We hear um, propaganda, if you can put it like that. We need a university and someone who big, brings that bigger understanding, that brings that civilized understanding. And that to me is like the biggest contribution that you can give us, some tools, something to make us understand um, the society in which we live. So that responsibility that it seems like the BSGS initiative is taking and uh, more than uh, the academic sphere is taking now, that is such an important uh, message to put across. We need tools we need uh, something that starts that engagement in us rather than that talk and that not fully understanding the complexity of what we're into now excellent i think that's a pretty good place to uh, place to stop actually i think we've come uh, come a long way and, and and kind of managed to to reflect very well on, on this interdisciplinarity and, and speed versus not speed and, and our responsibility as educators. So uh, I want to thank you all uh, for, for taking part in this uh, very nice discussion. Uh, and uh, let's wish each other good luck in our, <laughs> in our education, both uh, as educators and as students. Thank you very much. <laughs>